It's recording. Thank you. Uh, so I was told that this is some kind of, of more, uh, not such technical or, or a, a kind of seminar. So feel, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions and all that. Uh, what I'm going, I want to talk to you today is uh, about ecosystem and fragility. Uh, what we think is a new theory for ecosystem health uh, from information theory under a complexity perspective. Uh, so let me warn you that I'm a physicist uh, working in ecology, so it is some kind of, of a, a very mixed thing uh, between mathematical uh, concepts and tools and ideas from, from uh, theoretical physics uh, trying to, to make sense of this very uh, complex and, and difficult uh, subject of ecology. Uh, Mm -hmm. ah. So, uh, as I was telling you, I'm a physicist. Uh, my, my, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> my PhD is in, in earth system, in, in earth science. Uh, I was uh, told that my, my subject was a uh, groundwater flow uh, modeling. But really, it was uh, about physics and quantum theory and, and, and something like that. Uh, <laughs> so whenever uh, uh, people tell me, don't do that, that's me. Uh, and uh, this is a, a word cloud about, uh, made by, by, the, uh, my, by my papers. Uh, uh, and if you, if you see here, there's a lot of different kinds of, of words. Uh, from poverty, groundwater, uh, vegetation, socioeconomics, uh, agent a modeling, new, new and so on. theory of ecosystem health for, from information theory and complexity. Yes, that. <laughs> and, and so I, I think of myself like, uh, like doing this kind of, of levy flights. Uh, maybe you are uh, familiar with the, with the concept. And the, the, the main idea is that whenever uh, uh, an agent tries to explore a complex environment, uh, the, the best way of doing that is doing levy flights that are composed by this local uh, uh, local search, and then you make a flight, a very big uh, step away of, from that region. And in, in this new region, you make a local exploration, and then another flight, local exploration, another flight, local exploration, and so on. So this is a, 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 a fractal-like uh, uh, search pattern. And it's both, uh, it's both uh, empirical and theoretical uh, support that this is the best way of, of searching into complex environments. Uh, as, as I think this, the, the scientific knowledge uh, is the landscape. Uh, very um, funny thing is that my very first paper uh, as an undergraduate uh, student was, was uh, precisely about how um, uh, monkeys move in, 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 in forest, uh, doing this kind of, of levy flights, and how does that uh, make some feedbacks to, to vegetation uh, structure. And it was a time when this kind of, um, of foraging uh, patterns was like a hot topic. Uh, so I, I have this kind of, of of feeling that uh, we need to, to, to be doing not only uh, theoretical things, I like uh, theoretical physics, that's like my, my main uh, interest, but I'm also concerned about uh, practical uh, issues. So I, can, I, I try to, to do the research in this ABC uh, perspective, apply basic combined, so I work uh, both into in uh, complexity science center at UNAM, the C3, and I also work in CONABIO, the National Commission for uh, for Biodiversity. So in here, I I kind of do theoretical things, and in here we try to resolve uh, more, much more practical problems, like try to understand uh, uh, the biodiversity uh, patterns in Mexico. 
in order to make better policies. Uh, I I'm going to, to leave you uh, the presentation with Sofia or, or for you to, to have it because it has a lot of, of links and, and expo exploration uh, papers and, and that kind of stuff in, in case you are interested in, in, in anything I'm going to, to share with you. Uh, so uh, this complex uh, complexity perspective is like uh, in, in, in one part, like complexity lens uh, to enhance how we uh, uh, understand uh, the reality we are trying to, to research. And in the other hand, we have this kind of complexity tools, mainly mathematical and uh, computational modeling. And there's a, a philosophical uh, component that I call the science in Alpine style. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about that uh, unless you ask me, uh, but in the presentation, there's a, a lot of things about that. If, if you want to, to, to know what I'm talking about when I say Alpine style. Uh, but why sh we should care about the uh, health of ecosystems? Well, one reason is because we are already in a biodiversity loss era, uh, and it's uh, very well established that there is a, a strong biodiversity disease interaction. Uh, the exact, uh, the exact uh, nature of this interaction is an open question. There's this uh, very interesting uh, paper by my friend Rodolfo Dils about definition in the Anthropocene. And the word is crossed because for me, it is not an Anthropocene, but a Technocene. Uh, here's the link to the paper about that. Uh, so we have this kind of problems about sonotic cut, the basic uh, diversity, and how it increased uh, with human dominated ecosystems. So Rodolfo tests some ideas about this in Africa in a pairwise design in which uh, the, he, he had these um, very near sites, one uh, in which big animals uh, may allow to, to be, and the other one uh, using bar uh, physical barriers, uh, they constrain the presence of, of big animals. So there was, in, in that case, uh, they have a lot, uh, like a lot of, of food uh, uh, in, the, in trees that uh, may fall into the, into the soil, and, and be eaten by rodents. So they have this kind of ratification processes and increasing rodent numbers. And there's this idea about the dilution effect in ecosystems uh, and, and the effects of, of how, uh, when you take, uh, take out some components, uh, uh, in this case, big animals, then uh, you have, a, a, uh, let's say, an increment of ectoparasites uh, because of the of the increasing rodent numbers and those ectoparasites, that's uh, pathogens, and they test for, for different pathogens. They found all these, including for, for example, uh, the black beast, so very bad news. Uh, and we think that these two components of uh, deforestation and deforestation are indeed uh, only one part of a multidimensional problem of pandemics. Uh, we have deforestation, deforestation, but also hypercentralism in institutions, hyperconnectivity, and some kind of uh, modern wave of life, uh, mainly uh, considering uh, technological hypercoupling and some kind of lack of classical values as a skin in the game, uh, which translate, for example, in comorbidities uh, like obesity and diabetes. Uh, also, for example, in, in more zoonosis, uh, increasing probability of viruses uh, jumping from humans, uh, from wild animals to, to humans, or for example, institutional fragility and a slow response to, to the emergence of, of uh, epidemics. And in this uh, side, we have bigger rates and velocity of infection. In, in, in classical times, uh, infection travel at the speed of a camel, and now the infection travels at the speed of, of planes, so very different uh, landscape for, for pandemics to emerge. So this is a good reason to, to worry about uh, biodiversity because this coupling with infections, uh, infection disease uh, emergence. And also because in this paper by uh, Pascuale Cirillo and uh, Nassim Nicolás Taleb, they show us that uh, from all kind of um, uh, uh, big risk to humanity, uh, in fact, uh, pandemics is the most uh, worrying uh, phenomena because uh, it's 
the, the one that has the more fat tail distribution, uh, meaning that uh, very, very, very big events are going to happen. So pandemics are unavoidable. Uh, so we need to learn to how to survive in this kind of uh, extreme event um, landscape uh, we, we have built uh, that, uh, that Taleb called Extremistan. Uh, here's a, a link to, to some ideas about that. But first things first, uh, if, we, if we want to understand these kind of problems about ecosystem uh, health and interaction with, uh, uh, with diseases and all that, uh, first we need that. Huh? So in Mexico, we build this interinstitutional um, society made, for example, by the Biodiversity Commission, the Forestry Commission, the Natural Air, uh, uh, Protected Areas Commission, another another uh, another people of friends that uh, sum up to to make what we call the the national biodiversity Mon monitoring system in which we collect uh, historical data uh, field uh, monitoring uh, we use a lot of remote sensing for example combined with machine learning uh, algorithms to to understand uh, land cover we also have a, a very a very intensive a exercise for forestry data covering all the all the territory in a in a, in a network of uh, I think five kilometers uh, square kilometers of for for a space uh, intensity uh, so this is like a very big effort uh, for Mexican government very expensive and produce tons and tons and tons of data. Uh, but of course, we need to make sense, make, make sense of, the, of those data. And for that, we need uh, some uh, ecosystem health framework. And our first approximation for that is thinking about ecosystem health as integrity, uh, thinking about the state of the ecosystems, very much like, uh, like thinking about um, uh, a shallow uh, exploration of human uh, health, for example, taking some measurements about uh, some basic uh, uh, physiological variables and compare them to, to a standard uh, range uh, considered in, in health. So if you take some uh, heart rate or systolic blood pressure or, or so on, and you compare uh, in, if, uh, if, if that measurement falls into this range considered normal. Uh, and that's the idea about uh, considering ecosystem health as a state. Uh, so we built a, a, a model uh, that takes into account uh, variables about the composition, the structure, and the function of the ecosystem. Um, we think that ecosystem integrity uh, arises from processes of self-organization derived from thermodynamics mechanisms that operate through local existing uh, biota as well as energy and, mat and matter uh, at these at this dispositions. And this is some kind of, of optimality operational uh, search uh, for, uh, for the ecosystems. Of course, these op optimal operation points are not fixed, but uh, vary according to, to variations in both the physical conditions and biota and the interaction and so on. So we, we took uh, all these data, no? uh, all these sorts of data, including, for example, a very interesting exercise of citizen uh, science by Naturista. Uh, we uh, finally took uh, 25 uh, uh, variables to pipe into a, a Bayesian network model. Uh, so the, 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 the Bayesian model tried to learn about uh, using data from these 25 variables, uh, uh, how, how, how probable is that a pixel in the territory uh, is near uh, to a reference set of values of what we consider a, a, a pristine or a healthy ecosystem. Ah, okay, Gonzalo had a problem. Uh, okay, don't worry. Uh, so the, the, the model learns from, from all these variables and uh, eventually we, we made this kind of, of maps. Uh, green is good, red is bad, and, and that's fine. Uh, 
uh, but there's a problem. Maybe you you already seen it because uh, uh, most of the of our data are based on on vegetation uh, state. So uh, there's not so much uh, data about uh, wild animals. Uh, in fact, in this first mo uh, model, we didn't uh, include uh, wild animals because uh, the measurements was not robust mm -hmm. enough. Uh, so, so that's uh, uh, something we 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 want to 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 improve, and for that we are uh, taking taking the first steps to build a new uh, national uh, monitoring system, the CIPECAM, uh, that will cover all the territory, but in a much more uh, temporal uh, uh, in a much more temporal um, increase of of frequency measurements. Uh, in the in the in the other system uh, for for wild animals uh, we have something like one day uh, of measurement so nothing uh, in our new model we have one month uh, of rotational measurements in each site several sites in 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 these two uh, conglomerates of of sites uh, one with uh, with uh, high uh, ecosystem integrity and the other with um, medium ecosystem integrity. So it is a pairwise design also. Uh, we take uh, data from uh, um, a lot of, of, of sources, including and very important for us is uh, camera traps, uh, sound recorders uh, and Sherman traps. This is the, the part of the experiment that uh, would test the, the interaction with, with rodents and emergent uh, uh, diseases. Uh, we have also built some uh, apps for data collection in, in, in field. In field, we are we have developed some machine learning models for species detection. Uh, we have an online platform to data management, and this is the the, the experiment. We have these high integrity sites uh, alongside to to lower integrity sites. So this kind of emulates the idea of Rodolfo in Africa about not having big animals uh, in, in, in his case, because physical uh, barriers, uh, in our case, because loss of integrity. Uh, so, and we, we want to, to test also this idea about uh, zoonosis problems. And you, you, uh, doing that, uh, we have this uh, model of ecosystem integrity as a function of the state. No? But the, the, the question is if that model is a closed model, we think not. Uh, it is a picture, a photograph, but we, we, we usually uh, don't want only photographs. We, we want also movies. We want to capture information about the system dynamics. And a good, uh, a good example of why that is important is, for example, this guy is obviously uh, not in a healthy state because he has a broken arm. And this guy looks like uh, in a very good uh, health state, uh, but uh, this, this guy may have a, a very good inner dynamics no? in terms of his physiology. Uh, and this guy may, may have this kind of sudden cardiac death uh, syndrome. Uh, so one thing is what you can see as, as static and, and other thing is what you see in the dynamics. This is a general problem in health that was uh, that has been uh, pointed out by Spiro Matidakis, the, the the this professor that uh, uh, holds the the M competence uh, competition for for forecasting uh, data, and he has been talking about the problem of conceptualizing dynamic processes in health as if they were static and making the case for hypertension. So uh, how do we extend the idea of ecosystem health from a complex perspective? We need to, to incorporate dynamics. And one of the most important um, source of uh, dynamical information is time series, and especially the fluctuations time series. Uh, that's where the, the dynamic information of the system is. So the, maybe the, the first and seminal work talking about this in, in human uh, health was this paper by Goldberger in, in, in which he analyzed a fluctuation time series 
for her activity. Uh, and he asked uh, how, how uh, does this uh, time series uh, behave in Fourier space, in the frequency space. So you make here a mathematical transformation from time series to see it, uh, how uh, the behavior in the, in the frequency space. And if you plot it in a log-log uh, graph and, and, and the data is uh, good enough modeled by, uh, uh, by uh, a straight line, then you have a power law and that's translating to, into some kind of fractal of scale invariant uh, physiology. And this is important because scale invariant of the sim or the symmetry in, in a scale is, is, is like uh, part of a big family of symmetries in nature. And uh, we, we know from theoretical physics that symmetries are like the, the building blocks for all theories in, in physics. For every symmetry in nature, you have conservation loss. For example, if you have uh, symmetries in time, if you process, uh, you, you can go um, forward time or uh, in the other direction, then you, you have a, a conservation of energy uh, and so on for, a, for, every, for every symmetry in, in, in nature, you have conservation loss and conservation loss are like these big pillars in, in physical theories. And you also have, for example, in that case, um, a scale invariance or symmetry in the scale. Uh, this is very, very spread in, in nature. For example, lungs are fractals. Our, our brain is fractal. You know that the, the way you we see, for example, uh, rivers uh, from satellite is fractal and so on. And one, one reason these symmetries uh, are very uh, present in nature is because uh, maybe they emerge from algorithmic, uh, algorithm uh, efficiency. Uh, so maybe because evolutional processes, um, because when you have symmetries, you have this kind of uh, informational and computational efficiency. Uh, you have this kind of uh, repeated structures that save time and computational uh, effort and information. Uh, that seems to be a, a reason why we see a lot of symmetries in nature. Uh, but how about not only space symmetries, but also symmetries in dynamics? And that's exactly what we see in that uh, example of Goldberger uh, taking a time series that, that uh, encapsulate the, the dynamical information. And if you ask uh, if there are sy uh, symmetries or scale invariants in dynamics, then you have this, uh, um, this um, uh, let's say, a regime uh, called criticality. Uh, and we think that living systems need to perceive in general and respond to environments. Uh, uh, e for this, they need to make models of, the, of their environments. They of obviously collect data, uh, then has to, to make some inference, construct models, and with those models responds to environment, for example, for searching for food or, or anything like that. And whenever the organism has an advantage in that process, uh, call it better sensor or better uh, inference processes or better um, uh, computational capacities, uh, uh, in general, better models, they have a competitive uh, advantage and obviously that is good for ecological processes. And the way we test for this scale invariance in dynamics is using time series. So you take, a, for example, a, a physiological time series like heart, uh, heart activity, you take the fluctuations and from the time series of the fluctuations, you test using a, a Fourier transformation and you put it, put it into a log-log diagram. And if, if this data tra transformed in Fourier uh, are well described by, by a straight line with a slope around zero, then you have you know that the that the system or, or the dynamics of the system is governed by randomness. There's low autocorrelation memory, and there's low uh, predictability, 
And in terms of informational concepts, you have high emergence, uh, you, you are producing novel information, and you have low self-organization. You have a, a little a structure in the, in, in the information. On the other side, if, you, if your system has a time series and a fluctuation time series that is well described by a straight line with a slope near to two, then you know that the system is governed by order. There's high, high autocorrelation of memory, high predictability, low emergence, and high self-organization. You may think about emergence like flexibility, uh, uh, system flexibility uh, or adaptability, and you may think about self-organization as order. So this is a very flexible, adaptable system. This is a very order or robust system. So we have flexibility and robustness. And in the midpoint between randomness or flexibility and uh, order or robust, uh, robustness, we, you, we have this uh, sweet spot of a slope around uh, one, uh, which we call criticality or critical point. And this is where complexity lives in a good balance between emergence and self-organization characterized by self-invariance in its dynamics. So this is what we call criticality. And this, there is this criticality hypothesis that state that which states that uh, systems in a dynamical regime between order and disorder attain the highest level of computational capabilities and achieve an optimal trade-off between robustness and flexibility. So this is very important because as I was telling you, uh, whenever a system has better computational cap uh, uh, capabilities, it, then the system is able to, to construct uh, much better models and take better decisions. And that's good for evolution and surviving. So uh, from the literature, we know that, uh, in fact, uh, there is a lot of uh, empirical evidence supporting this idea of criticality as health. Uh, there's these papers about uh, heart rate and, um, and, and criticality, but also evidence of the brain working in criticality. Uh, so we, we kind of use these ideas to begin to thinking about, perhaps we could use uh, some kind of physiological variables of process uh, in ecosystems uh, as ecosystem respiration to test for criticality. So we use uh, hundreds of monitoring sites of the International AmeriFood Consortium uh, for forest in North America and we test for this criticality. And this is like our first approximation to expand the, the model for ecosystem health from a state to, to criticality. So we have uh, now that ecosystem health is a function of the state integrity plus dynamics criticality. But again, is that all? Is that all that matters for health? We think not. And this is a very nice paper by my friend uh, Ruben Fosion talking about another uh, important concept in, in, in health, um, uh, very well known by, by doctors, by medics, uh, that is homeostasis. So uh, Ruben took data from, from this is blood pressure and heart rate. And he asked, how does it look? How does the probability distribution of those um, of those uh, physiological variables look uh, looks like, knowing that uh, a healthy person tries to maintain his his blood pressure as asthmatic as possible, and and being asthmatic means to depart from a, a reference value very 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 uh, very small by uh, departs from this reference value. So we expect that a static variable follows a, a normal distribution and, and that's the case. But if you think about that, in order for these homeostatic variables to, mind, uh, to be a stable around uh, a characteristic value, you need something else to absorb the fluctuations uh, of the environment. Uh, so you need a, a, a coupled uh, physiological process that absorb fluctuations and that's heart rate. And 
uh, in this case, we see that heart rate has this right uh, uh, fat tail distribution. That's uh, like a fingerprint for, for, for complexity. And the, we see here the difference between these healthy individuals versus individuals with um, uh, uh, um, starting states of, of di diabetes. Uh, so we see that the homostatic variable, the blood pressure, start to lose uh, normality, start to build this left, uh, left fight tail uh, distribution, and uh, the absorbing uh, variable start to lose the fat tailedness. And whenever you see an advanced stage of diabetes, you have a switch from this uh, behavior. And now what was meant to be homeostatic variable like blood pressure has a very uh, distinctive uh, left-handed uh, fat tail distribution. And what was uh, an absorbing uh, variable now is normal. So we see that in general with process of chronic diseases such as diabetes, obesity, and, uh, and even um, uh, getting old may, makes you lose this absorbing capacity and you, you lose hemostasis. And this is pretty much what Nassim Taleb uh, has been talking about uh, from his work of antifragile. Uh, we lose the capacity to cope to, to, to perturbations of the environment. Uh, and we get fragile uh, for that. So we try to incorporate these ideas of how ecosystem responds to perturbation in this paper, uh, talking, introducing for the first time the idea of ecosystem of anti-fragility to, to ecology, talking about ecosystem anti-fragility. And if you are not uh, familiar with the term, uh, let's think about first what a fragile system is, like this crystal cup, so a fragile system don't like randomness, volatility or time, uh, because with any of those, uh, they fail or block. Uh, under a specific uh, payoff function, uh, they respond to perturbation in a non-linear concave manner. And in terms of, of time series, they manifest some uh, infrequent, but very big uh, losses uh, in time. And usually, they are associated with left fat tailored uh, distributions. If I ask you what is the, the, what is the, the exact opposite of a fragile system, I suspect very strongly that many of you or uh, would say that that is something that does not break the robust, right? That's like, uh, I think uh, pretty much every, uh, everybody thinks if they are asked about the contrary of, uh, of fragile. Uh, but robust in, in, in really is like this kind of constructions. It's a system that is mainly insensible to randomness, volatility, or time. They remain the same uh, on their specific page of function. Um, they, they are like flat response. Uh, also, they have a flat uh, time series, and usually they have normal distributions. But as the contrary of being broke is not uh, is not uh, having no uh, 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 losses, but being rich, the opposite of fragile is not being robust. The opposite of fragile, the opposite of being broke is being rich. The opposite of breaking is getting better. So an anti-fragile system like life uh, likes or even needs randomness, volatility, and time. Uh, they gain. They usually gain from it. They learn. They adapt, and they get better. Yeah? So the contrary of uh, of broke and fail is adapt and get better. Uh, the, the 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 response in a payoff function uh, due to perturbation is uh, uh, also nonlinear but uh, convex, and they now exhibit some very big, unfrequent, but very big uh, gains. And usually they are associated with right um, fat tail distributions. Uh, so this is like, like the uh, classification from fragility to, to anti-fragility. Uh, 
we use these ideas of Pineda and co-workers about, okay, you, for talking about antifragility, you needed to define the payoff function. So for example, uh, an athlete may be antifragile in terms of physical condition, but uh, he could be fragile in psychological terms. No? Uh, so whenever you talk about fragility, antifragility, it is associated to, to a specific peg function, but uh, uh, these guys ask about if there was some kind of universal payoff function for systems dynamics, and they came with the idea that it is complexity. Um, and complexity is specifically measured as the product of emergence and self-organization. And this, is, this idea is made from, from the fact that we know for, that, for example, in, in random uh, Boolean networks and, and, and other uh, dynamic systems, uh, whenever you are in a critical state, uh, you have a maximum uh, complexity. No? And if you have a maximum complexity, uh, we know also that you have, and if you, if you are in criticality, we know that you have the maximum uh, computational capabilities. So that's a good idea or a good reason to think that complexity is like a universal payoff for systems dynamics. And also it is very interesting that uh, whenever a system is in criticality, also Fisher information is maximum and Fisher information is, is related with uh, inferences, capacities. So when you are in criticality, you have a maximum of complexity, you have a maximum of uh, um, computational capabilities, and you have a maximum of inference capabilities, okay? So we think that feature information is a unifying concept for criticality and, and antifragility. This is something I, I have been working with uh, Pablo Padilla. Uh, we think that this is very promising uh, path. And so we have uh, extended our model uh, of ecosystem health as a function of state integrity, dynamics, criticality, and how ecosystem responds to perturbation, antifragility. Uh, and uh, the, the last thing we are uh, working on is how to assess planetary antifragility. And for that, we are uh, using much more first principle ideas uh, uh, by Carol Michaelian and the thermodynamics of air systems. And he has pointed out that uh, photon dissipation rates are a good indicator of ecosystem health. This is an idea that has been around maybe for, uh, from seminal works of Ulanovics, uh, where, uh, in, in, in which he thinks that health of ecosystem has a great, healthy ecosystems have a, gre a greater uh, ent entropy productions. And uh, they also point out that albedo is a good indicator of entropy production and also for ecosystem health. So, uh, but we know that beyond the absolute value of albedo as a proxy, uh, the real fingerprint of life and health is found in, in its dynamics and in coding fluctuations. And so we, we want to use uh, Fisher information as a, or criticality as a natural choice of, of, of tests. Uh, so we, are, we have this paper on revision uh, in which we, we, we try to, to measure planetary antifragility using time series uh, data for for Northern Hemisphere um, albedo for July months uh, from 1982 to 2010. And we see effectively a reduce e of some kind of uh, almost uh, half of a video of albedo official information in the planet. There, in, here, in this link, I, I leave you a, a talk of my friend, uh, Claudio Toledo Roy, uh, using not albedo, but um, uh, uh, planetary uh, temperature and not using fissure information, but criticality. And they also found a decrease in, in criticality. So we have this, uh, this evidence that uh, the, the planet is losing antifragility or the planet is losing criticality. And we, we are, uh, this is the, 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 the data, this is the, the the Fisher information, there's a net loss in this range of, of measurements. And we are trying to, to make a, a much more uh, 
a better <laughs> narrative to talk about a, a safe space for, for humanity in terms not only of planetary boundaries, but also anti-fragility. And uh, finally, sorry, uh, yeah, yes. uh, can you just explain a little bit better what you had in the, the previous slide, how you give some intuition of, well, exactly what you're measuring with the fissure information and the meaning of having a lower in fissure information? Yes. Uh, fissure information, uh, as you may know, is used for, for testing for inference. Uh, it is related with entropy, um, and whenever a, a, a set of measurements has a fissure inform a, a high level, a high value of fissure information, uh, that means that uh, you have good inference. But there is a work by Cabezas and co-worker in a book. I think it's called um, Exploratory Data Analysis from Fissure Information. It's a book uh, edited by Frieden. Frieden is a very interesting guy that has been posing that maybe the, the underlying language of physics is information. And he has posed this, um, uh, this structure of thinking about physics and science in general uh, using fissure information. And in that book, Cabezas and co-workers show you how you can measure Fisher information uh, using time series. And the idea is that um, if you think in, in the space of all important, of all important uh, variables, what we usually call the, the phase space. So this is a multidimensional space. Uh, so the, um, the region that, uh, that the systems visits uh, is a hyper volume. And if you have a, a very small hyper volume, then you have a very ordered system. If you have a, a much wider uh, hyper volume, you have a, a less ordered systems. And, and you can think in fissure information in this time series perspective as a measurement as a function of, of velocity in this uh, phase space and acceleration in this phase space. So if you are moving very fast and, and, and visit a lot of places in this phase space, it's going to, it's going to be a very big um, hyper volume and it's going to be very difficult to make a good measurement. So you have a very little uh, inference capacity. Uh, so there, there is this um, equivalence of inference capacity measured by efficient information and system stability. So the, the, the idea is that if you, if you measure fissure information of time series, what you are measuring is stability. Uh, and so, uh, uh, sorry, and the result you had in one or two previous slides that you found for the terrestrial albedo was that fissure information had been going up or down? Sorry, I don't remember. Ah. It's going down. You have, you have, uh, this is the figure two. This is albedo. This is fissure information. You have a very big loss, then a, a time of stability. Then it, it, the system tries to recover, doesn't achieve recovery and, uh, and fall again. And from this initial value for fissure information to this end value, you have a net loss of uh, some uh, near uh, the half, a half of, of of loss. Okay, but, but I mean, given the, 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 the type, uh, given this graph that you're just now pointing at, in uh, fact, I mean, interpreting the graph that you're showing requires a longer time series because basically we don't know whether this is, this is a variable that in fact just going up and down this, I mean, with just shut, such a short time frame for this graph, uh, we really yeah. don't know if there's a trend or if we, it, it's just a coincidence of the moment where you started and ended. Correct. Uh, we, we use the, 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 best, the best data available, uh, we, we find, and that's from 1982 to 2010. Uh, of course, we, we would like to have a, a, a much uh, bigger time series, but there's not. But my friend uh, took a, more, a much, much, much bigger time series from temperature, and they find similar results in terms of criticality. So in here they show that there has been 
a loss of criticality for the last decade. And also, uh, also for temperature, uh, uh, Cabeza himself has made this, uh, his same analysis, and he also finds a loss of fissure information for, temperate, for planetary temperature. So we have loss of information, for, lo, sorry, uh, fissure information lost uh, for temperature. We have criticality loss for temperature. And in here we show uh, albedo loss, uh, fissure information loss for albedo. So we have three, three different uh, evidence pointing to the same, to the same conclusion. The, 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 the losing criticality, losing antifragility. Yes, but the, the, the time series that you're using here is a, a, is a global average, or is this multi, for for each moment in time? Do you have multiple values, or are you just using the global average? Well, either albedo or of temperature. It uh, in in this case they are no in both cases we are using global values, and in our case we are using uh, only only terrestrial. Uh, North Hemisphere, uh, and that's because ocean albedo, as you know, is much more problematic uh, than that terrestrial albedo. Uh, but we want to use it also. We want we want to to make a second paper taking into account uh, oceanic albedo and also uh, southern hemisphere. But yes, it's global. It's global average. Okay. So, you, you may you may have uh, you may have also for example uh, local uh, behaviors no uh, but yeah, he, yeah. He, uh, but what we want to, to what we wanted to measure here is much more um, the planetary antifragility not uh, not regional antifragility uh, but the the underlying idea uh, of Carol McCallion is using photon dissipation so um, you may you might use local local data, for example, for for specific ecosystems, uh, and use albedo or other um, remote sensing val uh, measurements. For example, I think that that red shifting is a is a much more uh, good indicator for ecosystem health. Uh, but there's pro there's not we, we we didn't use that because there's not enough data for planetary assessment. No? Uh, but for a specific ecosystems or regions, uh, maybe you can find uh, that kind of data, uh, because they, what you what we really want to use is entropy production. No, that's what we really wanted to to measure. But we can't measure entropy, <laughs> so we have to use some kind of, of proxy. Uh, Redshift is, I think, a better proxy, uh, but there's this problem with data availability. Okay. Thanks. And of course, when whenever you are in this kind of, of, of in the frontier of, of, of uh, a field, uh, you also start to revis revisit other uh, concepts. And so we, we, we think that maybe an ecosystem definition uh, needs uh, some uh, update in terms of these uh, thermodynamic uh, concepts. And so we think that an ecosystem is an open thermodynamic system constituted by a, a community of living organisms. That's the same of, of a standard definition in conjunction with non-living components, also standard, that through its interactions and evolutionary processes constrained by external conditions, and this is the new, the new thing, self-organized in a maximum solar photon flux dissipation. This is, like a, like a, pro, uh, 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 a proposal of a very uh, universal abstract principle for, 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 for ecology, that ecosystems self-organize to achieve maximum solar photon uh, flux dissipations. That's a very big idea we, we, we want to, to push, uh, in which the systems is in criticality, no? So we now, uh, pointing to these uh, new ideas about criticality uh, with a maximum computational and inference capability that allows it to respond and thrive under uncertainty. This is the anti-fragility part. Yeah? Uh, so we think that in order to, to, to have a better and operating 
uh, definition of what an ecosystem is that allow us to measure, for example, uh, its health. We need to talk about uh, uh, antifragility, criticality, and what this means. No, so this is uh, something that we are we are very interesting of, of developing, and that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk to you today. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. Uh, first of all, let me apologize because I uh, I was supposed to be here at the beginning of, of the session and apologize to you and to Sophia, uh, but I had some technical problems to, to get in. Uh, thank you uh, to be just uh, on time. I, I have a, a small question because I didn't get the whole uh, uh, presentation, but just in your final slide, this, this idea that you, uh, that the, the ecosystem uh, tries to maximize the dissipation, uh, the, the, the flux, uh, uh, or the photon flux dissipation, right? Mm -hmm. what, what makes you think that now the ecosystem uh, does this, but for example, a million years ago or uh, 10 million years ago, when there was already other ecosystems on Earth, uh, they weren't uh, uh, maximizing the dissipation of, of, of the photon flux. Uh, yes, that's a very complicated question. Um, I think that um, maybe the work of uh, Axel Clayton uh, has, has tried to, to answer that question. Uh, uh, and what he has been proposing is that their systems uh, dynamics follow some uh, thermodynamics principle as maximum entropy production uh, principle uh, by Swanson. So, but this is this is problematic because uh, we know a lot of thermodynamics in physics, uh, but for systems that are in in equilibrium, no, uh, closed systems, uh, isolated systems in equilibrium, we know a lot of things. <laughs> uh, that's pretty much all the thermodynamics that we have constructed and understand uh, but of course there there are there are no uh, uh, isolated uh, systems in the in the re in reality uh, maybe only the universe itself is isolated so everything that we know for thermodynamics don't really apply uh, in real world uh, we need to we need to use a non equilibrium thermodynamic theory but uh, uh, that's sadly something that we don't have. We have some ideas by Prigojin uh, about not uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, but very near to equilibrium. No, so very near into equilibrium uh, under the correct uh, constraints. We know some some things about uh, about the systems. For example, we know that they follow this Prigojin principle about a minimum entropy production very near the equilibrium. So what this kind, how do I interpret this principle uh, uh, of Prigojin is that when you are near to equilibrium, the system tries to try to, to stay uh, as near as possible. And for that, they, uh, they find the way to produce the least entropy production possible, no? given the constraints. Uh, because that uh, kind of leave them uh, near to, to equilibrium. But uh, if, for, for example, that, that's what you see if you take a, a heat source in a water recipient and, and the, the, temperature, um, the temperature gradient is uh, low enough, you have a, a, a transport of, of, of heat, but not matter. Uh, and this is very low and very um, very well behaved. But if you make this gradient uh, big enough, you start to have a uh, fluxes of matter, uh, little volumes of water that are going to, to travel into in the recipients. And if you make that uh, that uh, gradient uh, uh, bigger, uh, then you you start to have um, a, a, a turbulence. Yeah, vortices. Yeah. Uh, vortices and turbulence and all this. And, and in terms of, of thermodynamics, uh, when, when you go far from, from equilibrium, you start to construct uh, structures 
that are more much more efficient to dissipate energy so it seems that like, yeah, like, for for me uh, uh, for me it's just the fact that it is maximizing uh, for I, I i go as far as far as saying that it is more if they are dissipating more but the fact that it is maximizing that for me it's uh, the thing that i i can i i, I don't reach why why is it maximizing now and it wasn't for example 10 10 million years ago or 100 million years ah, ago okay, okay. Other, okay. yeah okay the, 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 the idea there is that you you the system constructs these dissipative structures for example uh, the vortices and uh, and turbulence and all that uh, but a specific what the specific uh, dissipative structures uh, may may uh, emerge uh, in the system is constrained by the conditions uh, the the system is so if the if the condition uh, changes the the dissipative processes changes uh, so this this maximum okay. entropy production is constrained by by the condition of the environment no so uh, the, I, I i think i think uh, I, I i follow i think i i, I will um, since we are already over time, and there is also a question from Tiago, I think I will also send you an email about this, and, and, yes, and yes. we can continue to discuss. Sure, sure. Uh, Tiago, Tiago, please. Okay, so thanks, um, Oliver. So um, let me just phrase this and correct me then uh, uh, if I'm wrong. So already from uh, Schneider, Schneider and Kay, you have the hypothesis that ecosystems maximize entropy production. And that's why then you, they would have the albedo hypothesis. So that's mm -hmm. what they were doing. What you are now adding to that is that it, it being impossible for you to directly access entropy production, you're being the hypothesis that you can instead measure the level of criticality. And, and which essentially means that you still believe that they are at the state of maximum entropy production. Mm -hmm. And that means, so the, the a central point in your argument is that the state of entropy production is a state of maximum criticality. Correct. Okay. And, 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 and so can you just now, and maybe part of it, this was your role also answering to Gonzalo, but so um, what is your central argument for saying that the state of maximum entropy production is the state of maximum criticality? Okay. Um, I think that that, that uh, we are converging to, to that idea uh, because much more uh, evolutionary arguments. Mm. So uh, we we know that uh, whenever the whenever a, 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 a natural system is in criticality, they have these. Uh, better capacities for for inference and for computation and for making models, no? And there's a lot of work by Mich by Carol Michalia pointing out that maybe the the main driver of evolution is entropy production. Uh, so he ha he has developed a lot of arguments uh, for that. Uh, and what we have been doing is um, trying to. To take the the, the Michaelian arguments about entropy, about uh, thermodynamics and entropy, to arguments from uh, ecology and evolution, and we we find that they kind of of um, collide into criticality. So uh, because under criticality they have this advantage, and under uh, through evolutionary processes, and if evolution is is driven by entropy production, then you you have criticality and maximum entropy production. Okay, okay, thanks. Have you? Uh, uh, you're probably aware of the work of Jürgen Jost. No, I think not. Okay, uh, I can put it here in the chat. He might be an interesting author for you to to look Thank into. You. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Also. Uh, okay. If there is no other questions, Oliver, thank you very much for for giving us this talk. Um, and I uh, I will send you an email, uh, just making a, a point to see what what you what you think about. Right. Uh, thank thank you everyone.
Thank you. Uh, bye bye. I will bye. I, I will send you the presentation in case you you want it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Oliver. Yeah. Now my my pleasure. Bye bye. 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 Sofia, desculpa Obrigada. lá. Opa, desculpa lá. Olha, ainda estou ah. sem zoom. Ainda estou sem zoom no meu computador. Tive que aqui para o computador do Paulo e fiquei aqui a roubar o lugar. Desculpa lá. Não faz mal. Ah. Obrigada. Ainda por cima tinhas logo uma pergunta. Como é que tu fazes isso? <risos> Opa, olha, calhou ele dizer ali uma coisa que, que, que realmente me interessa. Mas pronto. Tá bem. Olha, ah, correu, tudo, correu tudo bem, está tudo bem contigo? Está tudo bem, está. Tá? Tá. Então vai, depois a gente fala então. Beijinhos, Deus, Deus. Deus.